when you eat a lot of sugar, your pancreas sends out this kind of like mass text alert. Um, it sends out this hormone, this chemical messenger called insulin. And now different cells have receptors that can that bind to the insulin and do things. And so most of your cells are going to bind to this insulin and this insulin is going to tell them, okay, take in sugar. And so these cells are going to take these little, um, take their sugar importers and stick them into the membrane so that the glucose, the blood sugar can get in. And your liver cells are going to turn on this molecule that's going to actually start linking those sugars into glycogen, so this storage form of glucose. Now, that's if all goes right. With people with diabetes, they either like don't respond to this message or they don't send the message at all. So with type one diabetes, this is like they can't send out that text message. The pancreas can't send out that message. Um, and this is often caused by like autoimmune um, conditions causing damage to the cells in the pancreas that actually are responsible for making that insulin. And without making that insulin, then the cells in the body don't get the message to let the sugar in and the sugar builds up in the bloodstream and causes problems, as well as having problems because you don't have the sugar inside of the cells. Now in type 2 diabetes, what happens is more just like the cells put this, put the pancreas on their like spam list. And so they get the message, but they're kind of ignoring it. They've been desensitized to it. And so you have to give them a lot more of the message in order to get the same amount of sugar to actually go into your cells. And so in either of these cases, you're ending up with a situation where the blood sugar is high, um, but the inside of the cells is going to be lower. Now, there are ways that you can actually get the cells to take in sugar, even if they like don't wanna. Um, so in the diabetes, it's often treated with insulin. And so in the case of type one diabetes, we're simply replacing the insulin that their bodies can't make. And with type two diabetes, you kind of have to give them more because they're desensitized to it. Um, but then this can help overcome that desensitization so that they can take in sugar. Now, if you have too much sugar in your bloodstream, we call that hyperglycemia, hyper over, but the opposite situation can also happen Happen, where you have hypoglycemia, hypo and below. Um, so your blood sugar is too low. And this can happen if you take too much insulin. And so in order to give the right amount of insulin, you need to be able to measure it. This is where devices called glucometers come into play. Now glucometers work using um, taking advantage of this thing called redox. So reduction and oxidation, uh, more on this in a minute. But the basic idea is that you can measure the flow of electrons, so of these charged particles from glucose in through a couple of different reactions and into, into this metal um, anode. Um, so basically you have this metal, these electrons get transferred, the transfer of electrons is electricity. You can measure this electricity and this is what happens in these test strips. Um, they get little connected to a little computer and then the computer says, okay, well we had this many electrons transferred or like, well, not, it's probably just measuring like, okay, we have this much amount of current. This corresponds to a blood glucose level of blah, blah, blah. And so this allows you to know, okay, well, how much insulin should I take now? And the amount of insulin you're going to take is also going to depend on the type of insulin. So as I'll get into there, insulin is, um, it acts as a, its active form is a monomer, so like a single insulin. But when insulin is, say, hanging out in cells or hanging out um, in various places, it can actually like dimerize, so two of them link up, and it can even hexamerize, so like six of them link up. And this is going to be inactive. And so this can slow the release of the active form of insulin. Um, and so depending on whether you want that your the release to be slow, so if you want something that you don't have to take as often maybe, um, or if you want need the release to be really fast, like, oh no, we're in an emergency situation and we really need um, to let that sugar into the cells, well then you can, scientists can modify the actual structure of the insulin in order to change it so that it either favors the monomerization, if you want the fast acting form, or it favors the slower release, so it favors like the hexamerization and the dimerization if you want it to be longer lasting. And so we can do, or I say we, but I mean like I didn't do it. We, scientists can do this um, based in large part on the work of Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, who was like a pioneering X-ray crystallographer, more on that in a minute. Um, but basically she was able to help show where these interactions between those different um, insulin monomers were taking place so that we can manipulate them in order to make these like designer insulins.
And so now let's step back and talk in a little more detail about how these various steps work, um, how they're influenced in various diseases, how we can take advantage of the properties of these molecules in order to measure them, all of that cool biochemistry. Um, so let's dive in. So insulin is a hormone. It's a chemical messenger. There are different types of hormones and insulin is classified as a peptide hormone. So if you hear peptide, think like proteins. So these are made up of amino acids, um, these chains of protein letters. So each of these little circles is representing one of these amino acids. And basically a peptide, we typically think of a peptide as a shorter chain. Um, and, but the terminology is a little like fuzzy. In the case of insulin, the terminology gets even more confusing because insulin has this kind of weird structure where it has these multiple chains and then the multiple chains can link together and you get ligamentization, you get all this complicated stuff. So I just wanted to get this out of the way first so we're all on the same page. Insulin gets made as this single long precursor pre-pro-insulin. So basically the ribosomes are the protein making instructions or pro protein making machinery, they take the instructions for making insulin and they make this one long chain called pre-pro insulin. And this is not the active form, this is like a precursor. It starts with this signal peptide. So the first part that comes out of the ribosome is actually just going to tell the cellular machinery, the other machinery in the cell, hey, take this to the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and so that's this compartment inside of the cell where you can do some sort of special processing. And so the insulin needs special processing because it has things like these disulfide bonds. So these cross links between different parts of this one chain. Once these cross links are made, well, now this protein, this chain can actually get cut in a couple places. And when this gets cut, you're left with mature insulin and you actually have these two chains, but they're linked together through those disulfide bonds, which are these strong bonds. And so you have these two chains that started, that came from the single chain. Now you have these two chains, but they're held together. And this is going to be the mature monomer, the mature form of insulin. This is the active form and it is the monomer. So this is a single thing, um, even though it's like those two chains, you think about this as a single unit. This is important to keep in mind because it can also oligomerize. So multiple copies can bind together. It can dimerize, so two copies together, and it can hexamerize, so six copies together. And we'll get more into this later. This hexamer form is great for your pancreas because it's able to store a lot of insulin without taking up a lot of space. But it's not good if you need it to be fast acting. And so what actually happens is that inside of the pancreas, the conditions are going to favor the hexamerization but outside of the pancreas, the conditions are going to favor the monomerization um, for various reasons, including differences in the pH as well as zinc. So these are held together with the help of zinc ions. The concentration of the zinc ions is going to be lower inside of the pancreas uh, or higher inside of the pancreas, lower outside of the pancreas. And that's going to, once the zinc ions are lower, then the different chains are going to, those different mature insulin monomers are actually going to start repelling each other. Um, they have these negatively charged um, amino acids called glutamates that are in close proximity. And without that uh, zinc helping to neutralize their negative charge, they're going to repel each other and favor the monomerization. And we'll get more into this later, but I just wanted to give you a sense of kind of one of the places where we're going to be going with this post and some of the cool biochemistry. Okay. So your pancreas is going to send out this insulin message. And what happens is that cells throughout the body are going to have insulin receptors. These insulin receptors, so basically these membrane brown proteins that are going to bind to that insulin and respond. And the way that these cells respond is going to depend on the cell type and the type of receptors they have, the type of things that are being made inside of the cell, so that what genes are being expressed, et cetera, et cetera. So most of your cells, they're going to respond by just taking in glucose. So they're going to have these glucose importers kind of waiting around in the cells in, in like little membrane, membrane pouches inside of the cells. These, because these proteins, these glucose importers are membrane proteins, they need to be embedded in the membrane to kind of give the glucose a path through. So they're made and then they have to be stored in an internal membrane. So they're kind of like in these pouches. What happens is that when the insulin gives them the message, those pouches kind of merge with the outer membrane and that inserts those glucose importers into the outer membrane so that you can import the sugar into the cells. 
now something special is going to happen in your liver and muscle cells and you're going to um, start linking those individual glucoses up into chains of glycogen for storage, so for energy, um, for later use. And all of this means that as an end result, your blood sugar is going to decrease from normal to normal, even if you eat a lot of sugar. This is assuming that you don't have diabetes, of course. So with people with diabetes, they're either in type one diabetes, what happens is the insulin isn't send, the pancreas isn't sending out that message to, they, they're just not releasing that insulin. And so the cells aren't getting the message to let the glucose in. And this is leading to the blood sugar rising if you eat a lot of sugar. In type two diabetes, what's happening is that the message is getting sent by the pancreas, but the, the cells are kind of ignoring it. So they've been desensitized to it. To get around these problems, um, sometimes you can basically just give insulin. And you need to be able to know, however, how much insulin to give. And this is where, so we don't, pro so if you have hyperglycemia, that's too much blood sugar. And so then you would want to give insulin in order to let that blood sugar actually into the cells. But you don't want to let too much because then you get hypoglycemia where you don't have enough um, sugar in the blood. Um, and so you need to be able to measure it. And this is where um, glucometers can come in to help measure glucose. Now, glucometers are going to take advantage of oil rig or redox, uh, which I always think of as oil rig. It helps you remember that oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. So each of these different circles is representing an atom. Um, so carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. These are made up of smaller parts. So these subatomic particles these subatomic particles include protons, which are positively charged, neutrons, which are neutral, and electrons. So the electrons are what we're going to focus on. These electrons are negatively charged, and they're what they're how the way in which atoms interact with one another. And so atoms can actually share pairs of electrons in order to form bonds. And so when we look at one of these lines that's representing a shared pair of electrons, see two lines that's representing two shared pairs of electrons. Um, these electrons can also get transferred. And when we talk about the flow of electrons, we, then we're talking about electricity, and this is something that can get measured. So glucose is what we call a reducing sugar. So if we go back to oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So if glucose is reducing something, that means that it is giving something electrons. So glucose itself is losing electrons. And when glucose loses electrons, what it's doing is basically it's reacting to form this gluconic acid. So you can see right here, what we have is an aldehyde. So we have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and attached to a hydrogen. And we're changing this into a carboxylic acid. So you can see that we're adding this oxygen here. Now, what we're doing in the process is we're actually losing electrons. And so much more on redox and other posts. But basically, a lot of times when we talk about oxidation, it involves a gain of a bond to oxygen or a loss of a bond to hydrogen. Um, and when we talk about reduction, it often involves a loss of a bond to oxygen or a gain of a bond to hydrogen. This is um, for reasons outside the scope of the post. But basically, when the molecules are sharing those electrons, they don't always share fairly. And so hydrogen has a really hard time holding on to electrons, whereas oxygen is really, really greedy with those electrons. So basically, because oxygen is so hardy, if you form a bond to oxygen, it's kind of like you're losing electrons to that oxygen because it's going to steal them from you. Whereas if you gain a bond to hydrogen, since the hydrogen can't hold on very well, it's kind of like you get free electrons. And so if we look at this reaction, we can see, okay, we're forming this bond to oxygen. This is going to be an oxidation reaction. Um, and we're and so we also, but this also means that we're going to be losing these electrons. Now you can't just lose electrons. It has to be going somewhere. And it's not, these electrons can't just like vanish. And so where these electrons are going in these glucometers is they're actually going to this enzyme called glucose oxidase, sometimes they're um, abbreviated as GOX. Um, and also other, some tests um, use glucose dehydrogenase. Um, so dehydrogenase, so you're actually like dehydrogen, you're removing the hydrogen, you're replacing it with an oxygen. Um, so these are just different enzymes, but they're both doing the same sort of reaction. Now an enzyme, you 
you don't need an enzyme in order to get this reaction to work, but in this case, we're using an enzyme in these reactions so that we can actually get better specificity. So an enzyme is typically a protein that helps speed up or catalyze a reaction. So, and these are very, enzymes are very specific or at least fairly specific, a lot more specific than just if you were to let these, let the glucose react with various chemicals in a test tube, which we can do. And this is actually the basis of some common laboratory tests, such as Benedict's reagent and like Belling's tests and things like this, where you're actually testing for the presence of reducing agents or aldehydes, um, reducing sugars or aldehydes. And so, but we want more specificity here because we don't want to just measure any sort of aldehyde or any sort of reducing sugar that's in the blood. We want to measure glucose specifically. And so these test strips, they typically have you like a little part where you put the blood and then inside of that, the blood then like binds to this little, um, this membrane that on top of the membrane, like glued to the membrane is going to be this enzyme that can then, if glucose is present, it's going to catalyze this reaction. So it's going to facilitate the transfer of electrons from glucose to glucose oxidase. Now, when, if that's assuming that glucose is present um, and the more glucose that's present, the more this reaction is going to happen and the more electrons are going to get transferred. In order to like do what it does, so glucose oxidase is an enzyme. So an enzyme by definition, it helps speed up reactions, but it doesn't get used up in the process. And so glucose oxidase needs a way to like reset itself. And in order to reset itself, it has to give those electrons to something else. It gives those re electrons to an oxidized iron complex. Um, so often these is going to be like a metal complex like potassium ferrocyanide, um, aka pr Prussian red. In its normal form, this um, glucose oxidase would be giving the would be giving it these electrons to water and oxygen to make hydrogen peroxide. But in this case, we want something that we can actually measure. And so we want this metal complex that's going to be able to then transfer it to this electrode so we can measure the current. We can measure that transfer of electrons. So you get two electrons per glucose. And so this is going to be twice per glucose. You're changing this oxidized iron complex, so Fe3 plus, to this reduced iron complex, Fe2 two plus. Um, and so you can see that the charge is reducing because you're adding an electron, which is negatively charged. That electron then gets transferred to the electrode, and you can measure the transfer of the electrons as electricity. So this is measured as electric, this electric current is measured, and that can be converted into how much glucose was actually present in the first place. Um, so this is a very useful thing. Um, and this uh, having this enzyme here is very helpful as opposed to, as I mentioned, just having it so that you're testing for reducing sugars. And so just a note on reducing sugars. So basically glucose is one of a number of different sugars, lots of different sugars. Um, glucose is kind of like the mother of them all. They can get made from glucose by modifying glucose in various ways. We can classify sugars in various ways. And so when we talk about a reducing sugar, we're talking about something that's an aldose, something that has an aldehyde. Um, and so it has a carbon double bonded to an oxygen with a hydrogen on one end. If we're talking about a ketone, so a ketose would be like a sugar with a ketone. So you can see with glucose, we have this aldehyde. Some sugars are going to have a key, be a ketose and have a ketone here. If you have a ketone, well, then you are not a reducing sugar because the ketone can't, it doesn't have that like hydrogen. You can see like here, what can happen is this hydrogen. Remember one of the things about a reduction or an oxidation is that a reduction is typically, um, as the, an oxidation could be associated with a loss to a hydrogen. And so if you think of this hydrogen as kind of allowing this to be a reducing agent, whereas if you have a ketone, well, now you don't have that in order to reduce. Um, so it's not quite that simple, but that's a way that you can remember it. Now, glucose, it actually can form, it's typically in this ring form and only like a 1% of it or so is in this linear form. It needs to be in this linear form in order to be reactive, but there's enough of this linear form hanging around that you can still get this reaction to be, to occur. So that is the basics. Um, and so there are various tests that you could use to test for the presence of a reducing sugar, such as Benedict's. Um, test and you might do something like that in your OCHEM lab if you're doing like one of those unknowns it was my favorite well it's like my one of my favorite parts of undergrad was doing that unknowns test in undergrad so a glucometer can tell you about your present glucose levels 
but it can't tell you about your past glucose levels. So if you want a better sense of over time, is someone having like high um, blood sugar? What you can do is you can actually measure something called the HbA1c. So basically, I did a much more in-depth post on this yesterday, but Hb stands for hemoglobin. It's this protein that can transport oxygen throughout your bloodstream. And the important thing here is that there's a lot of it in your blood. Um, and the A1C, this basically, the, this refers to just a various, the tech, the naming comes from the naming of how it was purified uh, being like the third fraction of the second fraction or the, the third fraction of the first fraction. You don't have to worry about that, but if you want to know, check out yesterday's post. But basically this HbA1c is this version of hemoglobin that has been glycated. So it has this sugar attached to it. This is non-enzymatic, so it doesn't need one of those enzyme helpers. It just happens if there's a lot of glucose hanging around along a uh, hemoglobin. So this can happen in your bloodstream and in your um, blood cells. And so unlike those other cells that we've been talking about where you have to have that special, you have that insulin sensitive glucose transporters, what happens in your red blood cells is that they actually use a different way to get glucose in. And this isn't going to be reliant on the insulin. And so they can still take in glucose, even if the insulin is, is not being um, produced or is not being responded to. And so the blood cells can build up a lot of glucose, even when the other cells can't let in glucose. And so if the other cells can't let in glucose, there's going to be more glucose in your blood. And um, therefore, you're going to have higher amounts of glucose hanging around with those in those blood cells, which is chock full of the hemoglobin because the blood cells are responsible for helping transport the oxygen with the help of hemoglobin. And so what happens is that like, you get this glycation. So the sugar can basically just attack the, the um, or the protein can basically attack the sugar and you get this linkage, this permanent linkage of this glucose to this hemoglobin. And this can then is going to last the lifetime of this hemoglobin and of the blood cells, which is about 120 days. So the more glucose that is present over those 120 days, the more of this HbA1c is going to build up compared to the amount of like total hemoglobin. And so this can be measured to see whether glucose levels have been higher or, or lower over time. And this can give um, like doctors a sense of whether someone's treatment regimen is working out, whether they've been able to successfully um, control their blood sugar. Um, and I say that, I don't, I think that's, that's not really judgmental when I say it like that, but I just mean like that the treatment strategy is working um, and that the blood sugar is being controlled well with this treatment strategy. Um, and if not, something maybe needs to be altered or modifications changed, things like that. So, but basically this HbA1c is going to give you a better sense of the long-term readout, whereas a glucometer is going to tell you like instantaneously, do I need to take insulin now? Do I need to eat some sugar now? That sort of thing. But anyway, going back to insulin, let's talk a little bit more about its structure. So the primary structure of a protein is actually just a sequence of amino acids. And the sequence of amino acids is actually figured out um, by Sanger. Um, so you might have heard of, so at Frederick Sanger, you might have heard of like Sanger sequencing in terms of DNA, but he actually pioneered um, protein sequencing as well. And he was able to figure out the sequence of insulin, which although insulin is fairly small, was very challenging because of all those things we talked about, about having multiple chains and these crosslinks and things like that. Um, and in terms of the 3D structure for that, we have greatly to thank Dorothy Grover Hodgkin, who um, figured out the 3D structure of insulin and was really just this pioneering X-ray crystallographer. So I've talked a lot about X-ray crystallography in other posts, um, but it's this technique that we can use to figure out the 3D arrangement of a, of a molecule like a protein. And basically what she found was that the insulin, it is a complicated structure. Um, and there's been a lot of work since her as, as well, um, but I'm just going, so I'm not going to try to like say who did what or anything, um, just go over the structure of insulin. So she sort of solved the porcine structure, so the pig structure, but this is human structure. Um, and you can see that you have the monomer. So you have those two chains. So remember that you have that one long precursor that gets cut. And so you have those two chains that are connected together. These two chains can then 
hook up in pairs, so we'd say dimers. And these dimers are actually going to be held together based on interactions between these B chains that we'll get into. Um, and then these dimers can actually form these hexamers. So you have three of these dimers hanging out. And with some, this is coordinated by interactions um, involving zinc. Um, so this positively charged metal, that's going to help kind of neutralize the negatively charged amino acids that are hanging out together. And the um, negative charges repel, like charges attract, and so the zinc is able to help hold things together. So the structure showed that the dimerization is promoted by hydrogen bonding. And so hydrogen bonding is just a special term we use for these types of partial charge, partial charge attractions that take place between something that's electronegative, so something that's really electron hogging, um, and that has a lone pair of electrons. So something like oxygen or nitrogen would be the acceptor, and then the donor would be a hydrogen on something that's electronegative, so something that's electro hogging. Um, so like a hydrogen attached to an oxygen. Um, so hydrogen bonding is just a stronger form of, um, with, of partial charge, partial charge attractions that has a specific like geometry and things like this in order to be ideal. But basically it's just a form of interaction that is breakable kind of like, so it's not like a permanent bond. It's more just like a stronger attraction and it's helping hold together those dimers. And then those dimers are being held together in these hexamers and these hexamers are forming around zinc ions. And so what's going to happen is that in the insulin, there are these glutamates. And so glutamate, you see the glutamate is going to be negatively charged. And you have negative charges that are going to repel each other. When you have those negatively charged glutamates kind of being all kind of clustered together in the center of that hexamer, in order for that not to just fall apart right away, you need to have something positive to help neutralize the charge. And that's where that zinc ion is coming in. The zinc is going to help stabilize the charge, at least in the pancreas. And so in the pancreas, there's a lot of this zinc. And so there's going to be a lot of this hexamer form, and this is going to be helpful for helping store the zinc um, helping store the insulin so that you can release it when you need it without having a ton of stuff hanging out in your cells. Because remember, like each of those insulin copies, it then has to get surrounded by water. And if you have those insulin copies kind of like separated from one another, well, then each of those has to have their full coat of water. Whereas if they're cuddled together, well, now you only have to have water. Um, less water is going to be stolen for that. Um, it's going to decrease things like um, the total osmolarity and things like that, um, I'm not gonna get into, but basically it's good to have it in the storage form um, where you have this, where you have a more compact form, but it's inactive in this way. When you let it out into the bloodstream, however, there's less zinc. And so the, the, it's, also, it's going to be, um, those are going to be able to repel each other. There's also in the pH in the blood is going to be higher than the storage vesicles. So inside of the pancreas, it's not just like hanging out, it's inside of these little storage vesicles. And there's going to be a lower pH, which means there's a higher concentration of protons. So those protons are also positively charged. Those are gonna be help buffering things as well. Um, but when you let it out into the bloodstream where the pH is going to be higher, so it's less acidic, there's fewer protons, you get less of that buffering. Um, and so that's going to help promote the monomerization as well. Now, scientists can also promote the monomerization by actually modifying the form of insulin. So we're not doing this in the body, but you can do this when you're making recombinant insulin. So basically you take the instructions for making insulin and you stick them into other cells, um, such as bacterial cells or yeast cells or plant cells, and you get those cells to make the insulin for you. If you change the genetic instructions you give those cells, you can get them to make altered versions of insulin and you can get them to make versions of insulin that are either going to be longer lasting or faster acting. So as I talked about before, the hydrogen bonding is happening between the C termini, so the end ends of those B chains of the monomers. And so if we modify those end to ends, we can then um, make it so that those hydrogen bonds aren't forming or they're not forming as strongly. And this is going to reduce um, the time it takes for the deep for them to become monomers it was going to make them faster acting. For example, the insulin lispro, hemolog, 
They swap two of the C terminal res the C terminal residues that are important for making those interactions. So proline 28 and lysine 29 um, to lysine 28 and proline 29. Um, and this is actually going to make it so that those interactions aren't happening as strongly. Another one, Novo Rapid mutates a proline to an aspartate. Um, so proline, you can see it's got this kind of awkward structure. Um, aspartate is going to be more flexible. Um, and so if you mutate that proline to an aspartate, you can make it more flexible in favor of the monomerization. Um, sometimes, however, you want a slower acting form so that you don't have to inject this frequently. For example, levomir is basically insulin that's covalently bound, so it's like permanently stuck to a fatty acid. Um, and so this is going to make it stick to a protein in the bloodstream called albumin. Um, and then the albumin is kind of going to be competing with the receptor. So you have the insulin and it can either bind to albumin or it can bind to the cellular receptors. And when you have a lot, when you have this form of this levomere form, now you have less that's actually going to be interacting with the receptors, making it so that you, this insulin is going to last longer in your bloodstream um, and have a longer, longer course. Um, Deglu-DEC is a similar version too, um, but it also helps stabilize the hexamers. So that's the basic idea is that then you can measure your glucose using a glucometer, which remember takes into, um, measures the amount of glucose using the redox reactions um, and the transfer of electrons from glucose, which is a reducing sugar through a couple of different um, mediators. Um, so you have the enzyme, then you have the metal mediator, and then you get the electrons transfer that's current that you can measure. Um, and this is going to tell you about the glucose levels. And then you can um, inject glucose or then you can inject insulin or um, in order to promote the taking in of glucose if necessary, um, or if the blood sugar is too low, you can take eat glucose in order to raise that blood sugar. And we can do all of this thanks to scientists like Frederick Sanger and Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin who helped us figure out the structure of insulin. And so biochemistry coming into play a lot of places um, and hopefully, however, you don't even need to think about this stuff because you have healthy um, blood sugar regulation and you don't have diabetes. And um, this is just a cool medical story rather than your way of life. Thankfully, um, technology is coming around to make it so that there's like continuous blood sugar monitors and things like that that make it so that you, that people don't have to think about this sort of things quite as much. Um, but hopefully your doctors and things still do know all this biochemistry. So don't, don't scoff off of that biochemistry, remember. Biochemistry is awesome. Um, have fun with OCHEM. Yeah, it, all, it, it comes into play all around you. Um, and if you notice it, it can be really cool. So yeah, I just like learning. I'm a geek. Yeah, you probably realize that if you're still here. Okay, bye. <laughs>